This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to replace professional medical advice or be a substitute for therapy. Please contact a mental health professional as needed. If you are in need of urgent or emergency health care, please contact your medical mental health provider, call 911, or go to your nearest emergency room. The information presented does not reflect the opinions of those with whom we may be affiliated as employees, consultants, or colleagues past and present. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Slightly Sane. We are your hosts, Christy and Laura, giving you just enough to keep it together this week. Hello, Dr. Laura. Hello, Dr. Christy. Did you keep it together this week? Because it is Friday. I know. As best I could, as we're all doing. As we're all doing. So it has been a rocky few weeks for people. I believe so. I think that even if you were not a direct recipient of any of the natural drama that has come our way, you at least heard about it. And what we're talking about are the relentless storms that are coming our way for hurricane season. So we wanted to touch base, generally speaking, on that topic as well. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, people think of like the storm as just the storm itself, like there's a storm coming. Right. But there's all of the prep work psychologically, too, to get ready for this storm. And then, you know, once the storm is over and done for most people who are not affected, it's over and done. Storm's over. But for other people, the emotional task of cleaning up besides the physical aspect of cleaning up and just getting your life back together, that's only just beginning. And unfortunately, the news media loves to focus the stories on get out or you will die and, you know, all that other kind of stuff and doesn't really focus on what happens to people afterwards. And there are many, many people who are still struggling. And my heart goes out to everybody who is affected by both Helene and, um, I'm blanking on it already, Milton, Milton. because that's such a lame name, like Milton, right? Like, um, I don't know where they come up with these. I know it's the alphabet, but I'm just saying I don't know where they come up with No, I know it's the alphabet, but but by the way, I think that's also something that needs to change, and I was going to get into this a little bit later, but hey, why not? So, you know, when people hear these storms, and they're named storms, I think having a name actually (laughs) makes it less, makes people take it less seriously. Really? Yeah. This is just like Versus my opinion. Well, invest like, 85 is well, what Well, that's it, not even good either. But listen, I mean, if you really want people to evacuate, don't name a storm Milton. Name it Death Blaster 2000. Darth Vader. Something, right? Like I will, if you're going to name a storm, not invest, or you're going to name it Tamra or Joseph, I'm going to be like, ugh not a big deal. But if you tell me that like Death Blaster, Bomb Raider, you know, 4,000, that sounds like a lot. Sounds like I better pay attention to this storm. That might be why then they come in and scare the ever-loving shit out of you. And like you said, it was really a warning of go or die. And what do you think of those? What do you think of those warnings? I've I've mixed, I had to write an op-ed about this and I, I've mixed feelings about the warnings. So backing it up a little bit, hurricanes are interesting. I grew up with hurricanes. I'm from Fort Lauderdale. My husband's from Miami. We grew up with hurricanes. It's just a part of your year here. Where it's different is it's one of the few things that have a warning to it. Mm -hmm. Now, I noticed that the warnings, which could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. The warnings come earlier now. Unfortunately, it creates to me that fire drill phenomenon of because you're here and the storm's over here and they're warning us about it and they're sounding the alarm of leave or die, this one's going to be catastrophic. And then it's weather. They could only predict that much. I mean, I'm even one who gets angry and it's and it's like, can they just okay with the spaghetti models kind of thing? But it does create this, oh, never mind, it's going this way instead. Oh, never mind, it's going that way instead. So unfortunately, you should probably hold on to that leave or die statement until you really are certain this is a leave or die kind of situation. Because other than that, by the time the actual hurricane comes, you're like checked out about that. 
Especially if you've gone through it several times. And I think that's why people sometimes are unprepared because they are used to all of these false alarms. And again, there's this sweet spot of when exactly do you evacuate? right? How do you know when it's time? Sometimes at the last minute, these storms take, you know, a significant yeah, turn they pivot. and nobody was really expecting it, which I think is some of the stuff that happened like with North Carolina, or I think they expected that Tampa was really going to get it and Tampa really didn't bear the brunt of it. But, you know, one of the things that, that I think is important from a psychological perspective is if we look at the data, we do know that like this, this panic thing didn't work trying to keep kids away from drugs, right? You will die. Your lungs will rot. You know, that doesn't work. I did look at some of the research for this op-ed that I was writing, and it does work for this kind of stuff. However, if you are, what do you do if you are one of those people who cannot evacuate? You have 10 people living in your house, right? You don't have the money to go anywhere for a hotel, You don't have, you have one car, so how are you going to fit 10 people? Maybe someone's on an oxygen mask. What does it do to them to hear the people patrolling in the streets get out or die? I mean, what can you do? What can you do, right? And and how do we help those people? (sighs) I don't know. I, I think the storms are a good life lesson. Honestly, you can only prepare so much, and then you kind of just have to use your ACT skills and accept that the rest is up to whoever you be- or whatever you believe in, and especially for people at that point who they have nowhere to go or people who uh, – that the part that breaks my heart on top of what you're saying is you know, people had to choose between do I leave my animals or not because these shelters – don't have enough room for animals. And I understand. I mean, you got dogs who don't, or cats or bunnies or whoever, you know, a peacock, you Mm -hmm. know, that you have, and they're not all going to get along just because we have a crisis. Not everybody's going to be on their best behavior. So you can only do the best that you can and then just hope that the rest is okay. And luck. People forget how important luck is sometimes. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at what happened with this one. Part, I mean, we're on the East Coast, for anybody who doesn't know exactly where we are. We're on the East Coast. The majority of this thing happened on the West. The West seems to be getting the brunt of a lot of stuff lately. Mm-hmm. It didn't always used to be that way. When I grew up, it was the East Coast. Good luck. Right. You know, like, and give it up. What, forget it. Now it's the West. I, You know, things have shifted clearly. Um, but ironically, this was one where... People mentally, we got the leave or die, not we on the East Coast, on the West Coast, got the leave or die messages. We did not get any of those. I I mean, did you hear any of those for the East Coast, leave or die? No, no, but I was in Orlando, which I'll talk a little bit about, So, because that was a separate thing. But no, we didn't get them over here because we were just outside that cone. Which is where now things are shifting to, it was luck, because we had in my opinion, Oklahoma style tornadoes randomly come through here and really destroy places. I mean, yes. in ways that nobody had anticipated. You can't prepare for that. None of the, that wasn't even a consideration and it happened in multiple different areas and you kind of watched it throughout the day. I mean, I think the one re- the one that was most close to us was at four-ish, four-ish, five-ish in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. Um, when it happened. So even those, you have the fear of now that's happening. Now Mm -hmm. we didn't get those leave or die warnings, but now, okay, either you were lucky or or you won't. I mean, I'm not even kidding you. A a fence separated a neighborhood who had a dumpster in the second floor of their home. I saw that. And every single car flipped over like Armageddon had happened. And then the next neighborhood over was fine. Mm -hmm. That's luck. You can't prepare for that. No, there's no way. And I did, I had to look this up because I was really interested in this is, um, all these hurricanes, all these storms are actually called tropical cyclones. So they may call it a cyclone. They may call it a hurricane. And so obviously you're getting the energy from the warm water um, in the tropical ocean. But what I found, according to NOAA, from they've been tracking from 1878 to 2022. Mm-hmm. 
generally six to seven hurricanes form in the Atlantic each year, with generally two making landfall. They have not seen any increase, substantial increase, in the number of hurricanes coming, but what they are seeing is a trend towards the intensity of the hurricanes increasing. So they're more likely to be threes, fours. I mean, this one they were saying could have been a six. I don't know if they actually decided it. So eight of the 10 most active hurricane years since the mid-1990s have, um, eight of 10 most active years have been since the 1990s. And what I found really fascinating, and this was something I had no idea about, the right side of the hurricane is called, what's it called? The dirty side. Yep. Did you hear that? I, yeah, and I, that's because that's where you get increased storm surge, and that's where the tornadoes come from, which I did not know. Yeah, it's just this is the first time that it really, really happened. You get these these tiny little, if you want to call them cyclones, that pop down. Um, this was the first time where I I just can't think of it any other way where there were, like I said, legitimate tornadoes where it spanned the highway. It was so large you could see it from miles and miles away that was the first time in my memory that those sorts of hold on ones touched down monstrous monstrous so monstrous yeah that dirty side thing has always been around and and like I said since it shifted to landfall on the west yeah that's always been our risk on the dirty side of it again in in my recollection this is the first time where this was a, a a large, large tornado like you would see in Twisters. I haven't seen the movie yet, but those sorts of mm-hmm. huge ones that you see from forever away. You can't do anything at that point. Right. And hurricanes are unique, in my opinion, because, like I said, you have a warning. Mm-hmm. Does, is, does the warning help you? Does the warning cause more panic? Well, I think that's an interesting point. So I was at a conference in Orlando, and of course, word was coming that the storm was going to be coming, and everybody was watching um, the track, and then they decided to cancel the rest of the conference that I was at. And then, so there was a decision, do you stay the night? Do you leave the next day? Do you finish the morning of the conference and then go? And as I was thinking about it, you know, obviously for me, this was very small scale because I knew I was going to be leaving and going back to the East Coast where I was a little bit safer in my zone. But I was thinking about other people who were trying to make that decision who were in the danger zone. And when do you go? And how do you anticipate the traffic, which is what I thought of. And even I left, I think, two and a half days before the hurricane actually came. And it was already a free for all at the gas station. Yeah, because Monday, so it slowed down a little bit. It was supposed to hit Wednesday into Thursday. It kind of shifted more to Thursday. So by Monday, and I only know this because we had just been on the West Coast as, as well. Ironically, we were sort of near the same area. And the highways were already packed. And that was Monday. Right. People and were not playing on this one. And I think it's because Helene had just um, unapologetically rocked many different places. And again, in other places that were not anticipated. Your Carolinas, you know, they just, in ways you couldn't even fathom. No so I think prepared it, for it. And I think, it, and again, I, I think going back to your panic thing, It was back to back. I mean, I think it was a week apart, Mm -hmm. maybe. Mm -hmm. So that's why when they said, "Leave," you know, it it, people took that much more seriously than if it were Milton happened a month after Helene. I think people people forget. I think that's a good thing and a bad thing. Sometimes you want to forget things, right? You want to forget how hard things are. Women wouldn't keep. Having babies, if they very forgot true, how, very how painful true. it is, there's lots of things that we're supposed to forget how painful it was. So I, I don't. I that is what I think why people really just got up and said, "Yep, they waved the flag. Let's go across to the east, or let's go up." You know, seventy five Alligator Alley was a. They were. I love Florida people. We will make a lane out of something that is not a lane when it is serious. So you got to see that sort of where people were just okay. It's a median. I'll make it a lane. I don't and, care. And so this is what I observed as I was going through it. I was I was an observer, right, of human behavior, watching how all of this was unfolding, knowing that I was going to a place that was probably safe, even though you know I was up all night worrying about tornadoes. And it made me think about what 
what Long Island is like too. And Long Island and Florida are, are very similar. Obviously, we're like sticking out. There's like only one place to go. So if you were in Florida, let's say, and you wanted to evacuate, where the hell are you going to go? Drive north? I mean, this storm was so mammoth, right? Do you know how long you would have had to prepare to get everything your car, in your car to then drive north and hope that you beat the storm, which is the same thing on Long Island. You have some two-lane roads. Once you find out a storm is coming, where the hell are you going? You got to go through the city, right, which is a nightmare on a good day when people aren't evacuating. And then it made me think also at the same time that I was in this traffic, and it didn't take me as long to get home as I thought, but there were trucks that were trying to bring equipment, and they were stuck in traffic. And I was thinking, can't somebody organize this, right? Like, can't we give all of those trucks, like, the right lane and just let all of the equipment go through and get to where it needs to be? To Can't we facilitate this process and make it a little bit easier? And I think about it, you know, we had Superstorm Sandy in 2012, and that was a nightmare. And I have to say that storm, which wasn't even considered a hurricane, was probably worse than what we went through here. And even then, we were sitting ducks. Where are we going to go? Or, I mean, the Katrina situation. Absolutely. Where they were, they were just stuck. Right, right. And so it created some anxiety for me. And like, okay, where are our people who are supposed to be, I guess it's FEMA? Is FEMA the one who organizes this FEMA in my understanding is after the fact after the fact again are very helpful I could be wrong someone call me out if I am but again like we have no plan for to evacuate that to me seems a little scary I think the plan is pick up your stuff and go and get on the highway because uh, we're all when we're scared we're all going to get primitive I'm not not sure if people are going to listen and I don't fault them for that because I think at that point you're like you you and you are who are important to me and you know, I just got to take care of my family. Or, you know, to bring in a funny slash interesting story to lighten it, you could be like my parents and they, the one time they moved, where they moved from the house in another place in Florida, the storm went there instead. Perfect. And they said they came back to the house and the house was fine. Mm -hmm. So then you have that gamble. Like you said, where's the right way to go? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I could be going right into this thing. But here's, here's the thing, and this is, this is the part that, that disturbs me the most, is, okay, we should know that hurricanes come to Florida, right? Like, we know that. So how come there is no coordinated effort to evacuate people? Now, maybe there is, and I just don't know about it. But how would you do that? There's so many Thank you. thousand That's, different streets. So do we just give up? I don't know if anybody gave up. I think they did the best that they could, given the fact that even think of from where we're sitting right now to get to the water, there's 5,000 different directions. How are you going to possibly take the National Guard and man every street in every county on the east and west coast of Florida? Yeah, I have no idea. I'm just thinking, it, is there a way to do this so it's not if Listen, do you know how much traffic comes in and out of Disney every day? Let's just think of Disney. It's a huge place. And the traffic actually isn't that bad. When I go in and out of <laughs> Disney, it's not when as are you bad going as, to Disney? not as bad as some of the roads on Long Island. I mean, I think they handle it very well. Now, I could be mistaken. Maybe I haven't gone to Disney at a high peak time. But listen, couldn't you do something where, again, the, the trucks need to get somewhere to help people? Can we have a lane for the trucks? That's usually why they, they sound, as soon as there's any scent of something, they send those trucks out. They try right. to at least tend, tend to them before anybody else to at least get them right. where they need to go. Which I think is great, right? Can we do something on, like they used to do in the gas crisis of the 1970s? Can people with license plates that end in an even number evacuate 12 hours ahead of people whose license plate ends in an odd no. number? No, because then you're going to have people turning on each other. And at least you have some identifiable group of people who are against Milton together. If you start doing something like that, people will turn against each other because they will say, why is your license plate more important than my license plate? I have a mother. She's 90. She's got to get out of here. Why is your mother more important than my mother? 
So that's the only one good thing of a couple other ones about naming these things is we all have a unified, identified enemy. And that's who we're against. And we're together in that. You start doing that sort of stuff. But do you really think that we're unified? Nope. Because there already is a free-for-all. You go to the grocery store and, you know, it's every man for himself with the water and paper towels and, and all of that. I was just observing it and thinking, is there a different way that, that this could go? I Again, I don't. I have a different opinion going through many different hurricanes. I think that people do the best that they can. Yes, the people to Publix first that bought all of the bottled water unnecessarily. So I get it. I get it. You don't want to be without water. And that's where I've seen them sometimes say each family can only buy two waters. Now, again, you could just have people rotating in and out. I think people always find their way around that sort of system. But at least that's some way of putting us on an even playing field. I don't even know how you would decide who goes first and who doesn't. Especially in a situation like this where half the people are from here and half the people live half the year somewhere else. Do Florida residents that are true Florida residents, do they get a priority? Because they're here or not? I mean, it, it, I don't know how that would even be decided. I, th I think it's the best system that it can be for the situation that it is, which is weather. It's as predictable as it is unpredictable. And you just do the best that you can with it. And then shit happens like happened recently where we had mammoth tornadoes come through in areas nobody expected. You know, the only thing that I can say that happens that is, pardon my French for saying this, quite beautiful about these tragedies is afterwards you really, really do find people being kind to one another because they've kind of been brought and leveled down to, do, do you need water? Here's water. I've seen that. So let's talk a little bit about some examples of kindness right after we take this break. Okay, so we are back. We have been talking about hurricanes, tropical cyclones, storm blasters, whatever you want to call them, um, and really looking at... Um, you know, we, we talked about the disaster piece. Now let's talk about the aftermath piece. We know it's chaos when people are trying to evacuate. What happens after the fact? People check in. I think people think of people that they hadn't thought of in a long time, you know. And it's interesting because everybody thinks that we all live in Miami. Miami is a long way away, but I get it. I was joking. I said people and people who don't live in Florida must think there's three cities Jacksonville, Miami, and then Orlando are the three cities apparently that exist. So I people check in on people that I don't think they've talked to in a long time. They do worry. I was, you know, responding to, to people, letting them know because they just heard a city and thought that it was our whole city kind of thing. So that's the other kindness that I also see is people slow down a little bit and do help their neighbors or do um, make sure other people are fine when maybe they haven't talked to them in months. And that's okay. Nobody gets mad at that. Right. And I think one of the things that, that can be very scary in all of this also is, um, you know, people, people missing or watching somebody have a problem. Because the biggest reason why people die in a hurricane is not like from the wind. The reason why people die is from the storm surge, from drowning, from maybe a tree branch falling uh, on their head. And there were so many videos this time, because of course people love posting the videos. Um, so many videos of like people just watching across the way as a roof collapsed and just like dragged their neighbors away. And like the, the trauma of that, how would you even deal with that? I don't know. It's interesting because being an exposure therapist, you think the more you see something, the easier it gets. And there's some stuff that doesn't. It just gets harder. I don't know how you recover from watching something like that. And I said that too. You, you know, my parents are south of us. I, I, I think it's harder. Some, I don't know. Maybe I'll tell you this when I come back in the afterlife or something. But sometimes I think it's harder watching because you, you feel helpless for the person. You don't you can't do anything in that situation. And I remember thinking that too. Just keep keep going. Don't hit my parents because they are going down with the ship this time. They just are. So 
I, th- what do you do? You feel so helpless to watch and know people that you care about, like your neighbors. Mm-hmm. You said they're watching their neighbors. What do you, how do you recover from that? And just this, just the survivor's guilt of, is there something that something else that I could have done? I had a, a patient who was missing, um, in North Carolina and she was located. Um, she had gotten out, but it was a while where, you know, we didn't know exactly where she was and how confusing that must be for family, for friends, um, you know, especially if someone is, let's say, having a mental health crisis anyway, right, and they may be off the grid. Um, or there's no, the other thing that was happening was the towers yes. were not good or there were so many people trying to get on it that signals were not great and it was causing some uh, concern. Rightly so. Right. And so, you know, my point in all of this is this is not an easy event. It's not an easy event to go through um, if you've just watched it ad nauseum on TV because they just keep showing clips over and over. If you had someone who you knew was involved in the storm or if you were involved in the storm yourself, I, I think it's important to really deal with those feelings and the fact that, yeah, there is an out of control aspect to it. And that's where we got to use our... ACT skills and just say, you know what, you commit to the action that you can about it and accept that the rest is, like I said, in someone else's hands Mm -hmm. and hope for the best and hope you get a little kick of some luck Mm -hmm. because it is involved. You can plan and plan and then either sometimes it's just about luck in life. You need both. You need both. Right. You do. Right. And sometimes, you know what, like we can do all we can to help people before, during, and after while they're going through any sort of event that's caused, you know, difficulty. And sometimes there's just things where you just hope for the best. Mm -hmm. There's no therapeutic technique that'll help. And that's the hard part too. But listen, guys, I think it's important for anyone who is listening or watching us. These are really, really significant events and you may not experience any kind of trauma reaction at the beginning, because you may just be so grateful, either that, you know, your family wasn't affected or um, people are found, but then afterwards, it can have a delayed reaction, and it can really hit you when you least expect it, and, and you know, obviously reach out to a mental health professional to help you get through this, because these, you know, I, w- I want to say it's unprecedented, you know, that's been a big word, but these storms, uh, you know, a storm that could be category six, that's unprecedented. Um, and don't think you have to tough it through because there are people out there who can help. You have to grieve Mm -hmm. and grieve a sense of safety too. Well, community is a a really big part of where people don't feel alone and that they can get through things. And I think that's what it's about. Right. Reaching out, helping your neighbor, even ones you may not know. I mean, I don't know everybody in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so if something happened, I would. Mm -hmm. We're all at the same at that point. Right. Oh. So and it and it is. Even if we're all okay safety wise, sometimes people say, Oh, well, you're safe, you're alive, everything's okay. That's that, not so it comforting. The experience. That's not comforting sometimes. I know the intention is is good, but just to let you know, sometimes people don't want to hear that. Exactly. Exactly. So, so anywho. yeah, so our take home points, don't be afraid to get help. Um, it is an experience where people are out of control. Mother nature is in control and just sending all of our thoughts or prayer and prayers to anyone who is affected. Don't forget to check out the Slightly Sane podcast on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. Give us a rating, please. We want your feedback also. So don't forget to write into us at slightly sane podcast at gmail.com. And we will be back next week for another episode of Slightly Sane. Peace out, guys. Goodbye. <laughs>